I'm here with Joyce Mitchell today primarily to talk about her new book, which will be on sale at the bookstore and here at the library. It's $20 and all profits are going for the first three weeks. All profits will be going to the library to support the expansion that is going to break ground in the spring. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Dow. I live in Hardwick and I am here to talk with Joyce Mitchell, Joyce Slayton Mitchell, who, who grew up in Hardwick, which I did not. Um, Joyce has published a book about Hardwick and so we're here to talk about it. But to set up some background, um, Joyce, I know that you've written a number of books. How many will you admit to? <laughs> <laughs> well, at last count, yes. this uh, new book will be the 44th book. Wow. The first one in the 1960s, and most of those books would be to do with U.S. college admissions. Yeah. Um, why did you write this book, which is called Landmark Memories, I think? You Why think you, that's what it's called? I think that's what it's called, something uh -huh. like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> what is it called? I, I, that sounds right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I don't usually sit and ponder what I'm going to write next. Uh -huh. Usually um, things make sense to me, and I had written quite a few articles about Hardwick. I'd written... Um, when some of the people I knew and grew up with died, for example, Mrs. Cobb, our Latin, French, and English teacher, um, Jenny Rell, my neighbor on West Church Street. And so I had kind of collected pieces. Uh, I remember writing about Claude Cross, our Hardwick town worker, and I thought um, I'll get those together and fill in the gaps of things I hadn't written about. I have written quite a few articles that are in this book for the Hardwood Gazette. Mm -hmm. And so um, being a writer and having written a lot of books, I thought, well, this was time I had enough materials to put it together as a book. Good. You grew up in Hardwick. Yes. Um, <laughs> Did you have much extended family in the Hardwick area or the northern Vermont area? Well, my grandmother lived in Hardwick, and I was born um, in Hardwick Hospital, right across the street from where my house is now. In my front bedroom, I look out the window and think, oh, you know, well, I think the police are there now, but Not, uh, yeah. it was Hardwick Hospital. So my grandmother was nearby. My dad, um, George Slayton, had cousins. Uh, Glenn Slayton had a sawmill up in East Hardwood. And uh, yes, I felt like I had a lot of relatives around. Right, so there was a big extended family to... Uh... Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> Good. Um, you were born in the middle of the Depression, which didn't hit Hardwick as hard as it hit other places, urban places. But were you aware of it? You grew up at the end of your, your memory would start at the end of the Depression and would very much cover World War II. Um, were you aware of the sort of the socioeconomic strata and, and damage that the Depression did? Yeah, I, I don't know of any kid aware of uh, economics and especially uh, let's see, I started, um, I, re I was aware of government programs like WPA that would have a recreation program for children, and, uh, but no more than aware of the school that the town um, sponsored. So, um, no, th the whole economic situation of Hardwick 
I don't remember that entering my mind until maybe junior high school. Yeah, yeah, and you lived in the village. So this book is about your life as a I lived kid on in the West village. Church Street right down from the library and uh, always walked to school, walked everywhere, walked to the post office, walked to my father's garage a mile, exactly a mile away. We walked everywhere. Where was your father's garage? What's there yeah. now? Um, I think there's farm tractors and, and so forth. Uh, it's down by, uh, you don't know where um, I the do, Ford but garage is? I do, but I'm not sure our, our oh. viewers do. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, I think it's called Lamoille um, Cars now. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not even sure it's just all Fords now, but it was Ford cars, tractors, farm machinery. Okay. You've written 44 books, which means that you write fairly quickly and easily. What was the hardest part of putting this book together? Uh, I couldn't really answer that question. I don't think of hard parts. Um, I'm always really interested in what it is I'm writing, uh -huh. and um, as I say, I've done a lot to do with college admissions, and I, I don't think of hard parts, so I can't really answer that question. I, I remember looking over to see what the range of topics was, mm -hmm. and which people I had picked out and and to write especially about, but I don't... I didn't think of any part of it as hard. Okay, so... Or even complex or right. difficult or... But when you're writing about people and you're writing about a community, at some level there has to be a process of deciding what you're going to put in and what you're not going to put in. One of the things that I do remember reading was your description of how you used to run from home to school and it took you three minutes to get from the house. You crawled through this place, you ran across that street, you went around that corner, you went over the bridge, you went up the... In, in just describing that, there were lots of things you didn't include. Um, geographic details, distances, that sort of thing. Is that a conscious decision or is that not? <laughs> not a no. conscious decision, no. It's, okay. No. Um, you've lived all over the world. What brought you back to Hardwick? Well, my family. My mother lived here until... Uh, my mother and father lived here and, and um, <clears throat> in the same house that I grew up in. And so I would come back all, all the time. In the, in the summer, actually, once I went away to college, I never was here more than a week or two, mm -hmm. because I always worked in the summer somewhere else, and then I was in college out of state, and so I never came back, although um, when I got married and thought I was going to live in New York City forever, which is what my, uh, my goal was, um, I, didn't, I wasn't married more than two, and my husband, I knew, didn't like the country. So that pleased me a lot because he knew everything about the city. And, and he just loved the city. So within three years of marriage, we turned right around and moved back to Vermont. And I, he didn't move back to Vermont. He'd never lived in Vermont. So that, it wasn't my decision to come back to Vermont. <laughs> just didn't work out the way you thought. <laughs> No, but that's often true with women. It doesn't work out the way you kind of thought it might be. Right. So when my children left home, and we lived in Wolka, when they left home, um, then I went back to New York City where I had struggled to try to get to in the first place. Yeah. But eventually you did come back and bought a little house here on well, North Well, yes, Main because <clears throat> the Slaytons always had a house in Hardwick, and my mother... Um, when I sold my mother's house, I drove over to St. Johnsbury to the bank that where it was being, the closing was. And as I drove back, 
You know that's a beautiful drive from St. Johnsbury <laughs> to Hardwick. I mean, it's an incredible drive. And I said, oh, you don't own any property up here in Vermont anymore. So within the week after saying that to myself, the Hardwick Gazette had a picture of the little house I bought now, and it said, whoops, this was sold, but it was turned back in again. And so I made a phone call, and then, because we had just sold my mother's house, um, and I, I just wanted a house in Hardwick. That's what made me want it. <laughs> That's why you get there. Right. Um, a bit of the roots. For your book, back to your book, who's your audience? Who is it aimed at? <clears throat> There's a lot of books about community. And it goes in big, it, it goes in big curves in terms of, um, I was especially thinking of uh, community building and um, the, the book um, Bowling Alone came out and it was when there was no longer teams like town teams, like mm -hmm. Hardwick. I, when I think of Hardwick, I think of basketball. And um, there was a basketball team for every age group, including the town team. Softball and baseball, the same. And so those were all community things, and I wasn't sure if they still did that in Hardwick or not. But uh, when I looked at the book market, I was always looking for a hole in the market whenever I'd write any book. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there, there weren't many community, community books about the community being together. And Hardwick, in those years, was very much a tight-knit community where um, the rules were the same in almost every family, definitely in the family the school and the church, and this, the little kid growing up here, uh, I would just uh, as often have anybody's parent say to me, it's time for you to be home, um, in ways that doesn't happen when there's no community. Yeah. Um, and if somebody else's parents said it's time for you to be home, you took that as... Oh, all, all kids did. Any adult. Any adult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, the, the, the village was raising you. That's exactly right. And yes, yeah. and that's kind of in the book. What in the book do you think would surprise most readers today? <laughs> oh, goodness. I don't... I, I don't... I, I would... I don't think I could answer that because I don't know the expectation of, of the readers, actually. Um, they might, depending on their age, of course, mm -hmm. and there's not many left my age, as I tried to think of classmates who would get a kick out of the book because they would know the same teachers I'd be talking about. There weren't many of them to be thinking about it. So... Um, I don't know what another, another generation would think about, about the book. The, the people, <clears throat> Claire Robe comes to mind, was a, a, a good friend. Um, and she pointed out to me that there's about three of us left in our class. And she, um, I don't think she'd be surprised by any of it because she experienced the same thing. Mm -hmm. And younger people that I play golf with, like um, John Robe and Billy Rowell, um, who grew up here as little kids and born here, um, I don't think they'd be surprised either. I think a different generation might be surprised. Yeah, the 30-year-olds who read it. Um, Sandy Atkins gave it a glowing review in yesterday's Gazette. Should I say when this is being taped? Um, the day after Thanksgiving and the Wednesday Gazette the day before Thanksgiving. Sandy reviewed it and, and gave it a very nice review. Um, 
which I assume is going to drive a lot of people to, to look, pick it up. And I just wondered if, I was thinking, how would they, how would they respond to, to the opposite of helicopter parents? You know, the, uh, the, that everybody was in charge of the kids in town, as opposed to, as opposed to every parent having to take their kids to the bus stop and every parent having to, you know, look after their own kid. Um, I don't know if that aspect is true of life for kids in Hardwick now or not. Well, I certainly don't. You know. don't, right? How, however. Um, Different generations, I think, often enjoy reading about other generations and how yeah. child raising was different and how families were different. Um, I, I don't imagine they would be too surprised when you see on the title 1930s-1950s because they would think that's another world anyway. Well, it was. Yeah. Well, yes, but I mean, depending on your generation. So, um, and after all, they read other books and even fiction right. from, from other periods. So I don't, I don't think that community, uh, which the book is all about, mm -hmm. um, would be surprising. But, but I don't know. We'll find out yeah. when I get people's responses. Right, right. Um. How has Hardwick changed since you lived here? What are some things in the book that people would recognize and some they might not recognize? <clears throat> well, um, we didn't have uh, big shopping stores outside of Main Street. Mm -hmm. And um, every Let's see. I, I think just the whole community feeling uh, is very different because I don't know if parents still feel um, responsible for kids that aren't theirs anymore in the same way that they used to. I, I think there's a little more worry of Maybe that parent wouldn't like it if I said, oh, you shouldn't cross the road here or something like that. Or if there's a sign up by the uh, swinging bridge, um, now don't go on. And of course, little kids, we would have run across that as soon as we <laughs> saw the sign, don't go on. And so I'm not sure um, that parents would interfere. They would see it interfering and not caring. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know that for sure. I'm guessing in general, because in Hardwick it could be different. Maybe they do take that much interest in other people's kids. Mm -hmm. Were you, you were in the village, and so all the kids you went to school with were kids from the village. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. No, some came from Woodbury, for example. Okay, were they bused? No, I know. We had no school buses. <laughs> How did they get here? <clears throat> well, they started driving very young age. They might be 14, and they'd drive from Woodbury. And there was one kid that was about my height, and um, he would drive, and I'd think, oh, how, did his, how does he reach the pedals? Yeah. But he would, he would drive. And, um, so this was when you were in high school? Well, uh, not necessarily. Fourteen? After, after sixth grade. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What was the question? <laughs> the question was, I was trying to get a sense of whether you were, how different you were aware of your childhood, how differently you were aware of your childhood compared to the kids who lived in the farms around the village. Between here and no, but let's say first grade, for example. Okay. Everybody, uh, some farm, a couple of farm kids that would uh, be brought in by somebody in their family, uh, but almost everybody walked to school except for those few I remember. Um, but 
the the farm kids um, from around here, the French Canadians, mm -hmm. didn't come down until high school because right. they had uh, their own school. Right. One through eight. So for the most part, they were all village kids. Right. First um, three grades, I can't think of any that weren't walking to school. Right. And s did did you walk with the same kids all the time? Or? Yes, you tend to, and and not just kids. We we walked with the adults that had come home for dinner, and then we'd all walk. We'd walk by the library and pick them up. Um, on our street, the dentist and the banker, Mr. Ladd, um, always went to work about the same time the kids went to school. And we'd all walk together in the road and up to the library and take a right. right. And then the dentist and the banker would take a left when we got down by the dummy. And the rest of us would walk up street to wherever they were going to work in their business. And so in those days, you didn't go down Riverside Terrace and Oh, and yes. No, we did. Uh, but we did both things. Because remember, we'd go in the morning, we would come back for dinner, then after dinner, we'd go back again, and then after basketball practice, we'd come back again. Right. So we, I might go by the library one time, and then the shortcut right. by Sheila Spears another time. Right. I'm reminded that Alan Davis says that in Hardwick in the 1940s, there was no concept of lunch. And you were talking in the language that you remembered from being a kid that you had breakfast, dinner, and supper. Well, we did. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and there was no, no lunch. Um, today, we think in terms of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Dinner is the big meal at the end of the day. Was, it, was dinner the big meal of the day? Oh, yes, for everybody. In the middle of the day, that supper yes. was a lighter meal. Yes, supper was a supper meal. <laughs> um, Sandy mentioned that you have a chapter about food and eating in Hardwick. Um, what what was she? Well, what were you remembering about eating and food in Hardwick? <clears throat> Uh, well, it wasn't just to do with hard work. I was talking about hotel food, for example, uh. in one, and that I had never, uh, I don't remember eating at the Hardwick Inn. I know, I was writing about the Hardwick Inn. And then when <clears throat> we'd walk home from school on that side of the road, where the um, Hardwick Inn still is, you'd look into the dining room, it's all white tablecloths, and people would be eating there. But it was pretty much the business travelers who stayed there. Mm -hmm. And they'd come to Hardwick and stay for a week. They'd go from Hardwick down to up to Greensboro and down to Wolcott and in the small villages around. But they would have dinner at the Hardwick Inn. And I wrote that our family never had dinner at the Hardwick Inn because we lived here. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember any adults uh, taking their children to eat down the street. But um, when, we, when our family um, ate in a hotel, it would be because my dad had business in St. John's, Barry, Barry, Montpelier. And so we'd all go and always had our big meal at noon, whether it was a school day or not. And then we would eat in hotels. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a little bit about the menu in, in the hotels, and they'd all be the same in New England, or in Vermont anyway. Interesting. Mm. Um, that business people would come to Hardwick and make it their home base as That's they right. went around to other places. Yes. Right. That's when there were trains. Did they come on trains mostly? Oh, yes. Like Sawyer Lee was the best example of selling uh, class rings to everybody. And Balfour Company, he mm -hmm. worked for in Boston. And um, th there was somebody from Newport even that came and stayed at Hardwick Inn. And there was a stage that would take them to different little towns and different high schools and so forth. The stage. Mm -hmm. What kind of vehicle was that? It was like a, a long limousine, 
but maybe there'd be two, four, six, maybe six, six, uh, three sides of doors that you get in. And that's what I'd take to Newport in place of a bus. It would be a stage. It, it's just a long car, like a limousine, only with even a couple more doors. And that's what the stage was. What? And there was one that went to Newport, one that went to Barrie, one that went to Montpelier. Mm -hmm. North and south. Anything to St. Jay? Well, you could take the train to St. John's Barrie. Well, no. We had Vermont Transit. Went from uh, Portland, Portland, Maine, over to Lake Champlain. The Vermont Transit and stopped at the Hardwick Inn. Huh. So when I wanted to have braces on my teeth, for example, and it was only in Burlington that that happened. And my dad said, well, we're not driving way over. And I said, that's all right, I'll take the stage. So I'd take the Vermont Transit bus. To Burlington. Yes, but it also there was the big bus, but then these stages were smaller, and they'd go to Barry, Montpelier, Newport, mm -hmm. all those places. Yeah. Interesting. And that was all in the early 30s that we'd have those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have brothers. Yeah, two brothers. Two brothers. Um, One living. Yes. Mm -hmm. Has he read the book? Does, does your younger brother, has he read the book? Does he? No, he hasn't read the book. He hasn't read but it. But he's 10 years younger than I am, so his culture was entirely different. Right. I, I wonder what his reaction yes. to it, but he, but he hasn't read it yet. No. No. He uh, hasn't read it because he hasn't had the opportunity to read right, it yet. Right. But you didn't consult him either on Well, that. no, because it's he's not his 10 memories. years younger. I left home and he was seven. Yeah. So yeah. his experience would be quite different. How he, didn't, he didn't listen to Gabriel Heater on the, on the news. Lowell Thomas, etc. <laughs> I should say he didn't have to listen to. <laughs> Did you have to listen to? Oh, it? of course, <laughs> because the movie started at seven on Friday night, and um, that's the only night I or any kid could go, and <clears throat> and the news came on at ten of seven, and I had to have a dime for that, and um, for the movie. Yes. Yeah. And if the news had started, I didn't get my dime until 7 o'clock, and the movie had already started. Right. So I had to really run fast to get to that <laughs> movie, not too late. <laughs> but the movie started with a cartoon and a well, news Yeah, reel. but I didn't want to miss any of it. Oh, no. <laughs> it was moving on the screen, and you wanted to see it all. Yeah. <laughs> Not, not, not to say you wouldn't know where your pals were sitting for sure, although you could be pretty sure you knew where they're sitting. Right. You say Friday night was the only night kids were allowed to go to the movies. Oh well, most kids that I knew. So the, the theater let them in, but but most parents didn't let their kid go to. That was going to be my question. Was that a theater rule or was that a family rule? Yeah, but no, that's a family rule. But the theater rule was children in the first six rows. So you couldn't, I couldn't even go and sit with my mother and father. Not that my father went to the movies. I couldn't even go and sit with my mother. Uh, I had to, the children had to be in the first six rows and they would police us with flashlights. And they, if a couple of kids started talking, or giggling or whatever, that flashlight would come right over to you. And boy, you'd be quiet in a hurry. Because <laughs> you wouldn't want to be, you lose your dime if you- If you were thrown had out. To, yeah, yeah. Be thrown out, <laughs> that would be bad. And what did you do after the movies? Well, we either went to Drown's Restaurant. Which was where? On Main Street, where Merlou's was. And I don't know what's there now. There's a park there. Maybe the co-op. No. No, the Merlou's was... No, it's further down yeah. than that. There's, there's a park there where the building was. Maybe. Um, but what was the question? Where'd we what do? did you do after the movies? Oh, after the movies. Well, depending on the age. But from, um, let's say, 6th and 7th grade, we'd go into Drown's restaurant. 
uh, which is a little above Cox's, which is right on the corner, and, um, and get a hot dog, which cost five cents. And a Bar's Better Beverage had the best orange soda probably in the world. That was five cents. And so I uh, often go in there and have a hot dog and an orange soda. So 20 cents for a Friday night. Yes. Yeah. If you were lucky, some kids didn't have 20 cents, they had 10 cents, so they go to the movie. And there, go was, home. there was nothing, and then go home, right? Mm -hmm. Did you work? Did you have? Did you get an allowance, or did you have to earn your? I always worked from six years old on. I worked, and I always had an allowance. But the allowance was ten cents a week. For for I don't remember when I said I, I I wanted twenty five cents a week, and I think in high school I got fifty cents a week. So there weren't many smokers amongst us because we couldn't <laughs> afford with our little allowance. Right. But I always worked. I always mowed lawns in the summer, and I always, uh, oh, I had at least one paper route that I write about in the book. Sarah Cobb and I each um, did the Boston Globe, delivered it, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think on weekends, and, <clears throat> and there were... We each had four papers, but they'd be all over Hardwick. It wouldn't be like all, four papers on one street. Mm -hmm. So we'd ride our bike and go out delivering the paper. I sold a lot of Christmas seals and, um, and seeds. You'd get, in funny books, there'd be a little coupon to send away, and then you, that's how you'd earn money mm -hmm. or a prize. And one year for a prize, instead of money, I got the American flag to put on our porch that I was very happy about. And uh, I, I, was, uh, I, always, I always worked. Did you have any resistance to the fact that you were a small girl looking for a job, or was that a non-issue? I didn't know I was short until I left Vermont just to start with. Right. And so, uh, no. Size wasn't an issue. Was being a girl an issue? Not for me, it wasn't, no. <laughs> it wasn't. I was on a, a boys' baseball team in sixth grade and seventh grade, uh -huh. and uh, it, it wasn't an issue. It was a matter of interest, not of gender. Right. You were on the high school basketball team, too. Oh, yes. Right. Yeah. But I guess everybody was who wanted to. Who, but the who, beauty who could of, go to who could stay after school for practice. Well, everybody could stay after school for practice. Uh, the, the the beauty of a small high school like Hardwick, you didn't have to be skilled in acting to be in the play because they needed the numbers. Right. You didn't have to have a voice to be in the choir or the chorus because they needed the voices. You didn't have to be good at sports to be on the team because they needed the numbers. So we all got to always do everything, even if we didn't want to that much. But uh, that was our community living. So there was never tryouts, meaning you wouldn't make the team because they would, you'd be needed. Uh -huh. And we didn't have football, for example, in Hardwick, because there wouldn't have been enough guys. Actually, there were four years of high school football, um, 1945 to 1949. Um, and it wasn't much of football. No, it wasn't. No, nobody was nobody had seen it. Nobody knew anything about well, it. Well, it was more or less football practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what would you like to say about the book that I haven't asked you? <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, let's see. Too bad I don't have a copy of the book. Man. Actually, I've never seen a copy of the book yet. Um, <clears throat> I, ha I think um, anybody brought up in a um, community or not a, a small community like Hardware, will be interested in 
and how life was for a school, a school child, um, just because it's all of such a definite piece uh, in those years. And it wouldn't be that different in this little village or a Connecticut little village because it was the time frame uh, and going into the Second World War that it's about and actually through the, through the Second World War. And uh, that same kind of um, saving the fat uh, from cooking in a coffee can is the same in Connecticut and New York as in Vermont during the war years. And all of America was kind of, kind of the same. And we all heard the same news. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think you'll just see it as uh, community living during that time period. And it's as much the time period as it is the numbers of people. Mm -hmm. um, that's my guess. But of course, I wouldn't know from, uh, from big schools where there was more of um, a mix of race. I mean, we, we had, everybody was white in, in Hardwick. And uh, it's, it's very different than um, growing up in any community that had um, Asians or blacks or, or whatever. Do you remember Phyllis and Orrin Bracey? Uh, only because, um, yes, uh, Phil, Phyllis came into, high, when I, I was a senior, I, she was here one year when I was here. Okay. Um, Orrin and Phyllis Bracey were black. Their father worked for the Whiting Creamery in East Hardwick. And um, for the next issue of the, which is say the winter issue of the Hardwick Historical Society Journal, Oren has written a piece about growing up black in Hardwick and East Hardwick. And his conclusion is that he never ever felt any racism among the, the people he worked with or the kids he went to school with in Hardwick. Um, yeah, well, I'm sure because we wouldn't have known what racism is. <laughs> right. And we were usually, uh, we had two new kids from first grade through 12th come into our class, too. And that was all? 12 years. And we were always so excited to see what they're going to wear because we all wore hand-me-downs or, or something your neighbor gave you. And uh, they always showed up with new clothes, at least the once, <laughs> and uh, as they walked into the classroom. So it was such a shock to have some, anybody new in your class that if they were black, like... Um, Phyllis. What, what was their name? Phyllis and Oren Bracey. Phyllis was older. Uh, I, think, I think Phyllis was in Keith Ladd's class. She's a year younger than I was. And, um, and so, you know, I hardly noticed yeah. because I don't, I don't even know where in Hardwick they lived. East Hardwick. Oh, well, that's why. <laughs> they weren't <laughs> even in Hardwick. I wasn't supposed to know. Um, you said something which, which triggered a thought which has now sort of, oh, there were not much. There was not much turnover in the number of st in the students who were in your class. Right. What about the teachers? Well, the first three, first four, first four grades, they were all women we knew. And in the fifth grade, we had a new teacher from out of town, and we were all very excited because we never had a teacher that we didn't know. And then. Um, in the sixth grade, the woman was from Greensboro, and so we knew the family name, even though we didn't know her. But in the seventh grade, we had a male teacher, and that was the beginning of the war, actually, and he was the postmaster from uh, Woodbury. And so we were all pretty excited about going upstairs that seventh grade started 
to see what a male teacher would be like. But it was pretty disappointing. He wasn't much different. <laughs> <laughs> teachers are teachers. <laughs> <laughs> he was. <laughs> um, I think we could wrap this up here. Um, thank you for the conversation, the insight into Hardwick decades ago. <laughs> we'll just leave it at decades ago. Oh dear. <laughs> well, you're very welcome. Thanks for asking about that. And if I had more classmates, but unfortunately, that's what happens when you get old. Yeah, but you still have a babysitter uh -huh. who's alive who says you were a handful. Oh, who would that be? babysitter that would be, still be alive? Lorraine Hussey used to babysit you and your brothers. Oh, I think that's in her imagination. And she said, y you guys were a handful. Well, we were brought up to be handfuls in Vermont. <laughs>